I said to you a while ago that um, I was thinking on and meditating on, on the theme of the God is in the detail. And I want to speak to you about I am in the detail. The God says I'm in the detail. Now this, and, and, and are you hungry for the word this morning? Okay. So the season has changed. Listen to what I'm saying. The, uh, you will find that many of them that has been with us, if I say us, I use as an example, but all over the world, that has been there with ulterior motives for their benefit, or what they can get out of church. You'll find them no more. You will find that those that, are, that you found in households of faith all over the earth today are those that are serious with God. You know what you're going to see this morning? God is also serious with you. And I want to show you what God is about to do in your life. So we pray that those that have gone and sit by the wayside, that God would ignite the flame and the fire of hunger and thirst on the inside of them again to serve the living God with everything on the inside of them. There's nothing else, nothing left for us people but serving Him, the creator of the heavens and the earth. So I'm going to give you a familiar portion of Scripture this morning, and I know many of you have quoted this. I know we have quoted it when we were in, in Italy, and they stole our passports. We had to get back home. We said, well, everything worked out for good. We had to believe it. But sometimes we have to go study that Scripture to really get to the full understanding of what it means. And this is just going to be foundation um, for us to, be, to, to have the benefit of that Scripture. You know, it's not just quoting scripture. You must understand the context. Because there's a qualification in that scripture. Did you know that? It's not just all things work for good for those that love. There's a qualification. And, and, and we miss the qualification many times. And we just quote the top part because that suits us. That's what we want. Okay? So... And I want you to pay close attention to the words. Romans 8 verse 28 says this. And we know, come on, it should be knowledge. It should be understanding. And we know that all things, say all things, not just some of the things, but all things, work together for good, watch this, to those. So it's not for everybody. Otherwise it, said, it would have said for everybody. But it says, to those who love God, if you love God, you'll be in church. Hello. <laughs> and then he says this, to those who are the called according to his purpose. So the qualification is love. And you have to be one of the called. According to his purposes. Otherwise, things are not working out for your good. Do you see that? You can quote it this, uh, till you're blue in the face. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain. I don't really have much time to, to speak about the call. But the call means I have found my purpose in God. I have found my destiny. I know God's hand is upon my life. I know where I'm heading. I know what God requires of me. And I'm fulfilling that. It's not just a haphazardly life that I live and I do whatever I do, whenever I do, whatever I want to do. And then when things go wrong, I say, well, everything worked out for good. No, I've got to be, first of all, if I love God, I love His purposes. I say, if I love God, I would love His purposes. And then I am called. I am the called according to His purposes because I love God and I love His purposes. Do you see that? And then when you find yourself in positions... The Bible says all things work for good. Hallelujah. So here you begin to see the distinction. And I want to say this. There is a cycle that is being described. Everything works together for good to them who are in love with God and to them who are the called. So therefore everything in God's universe, let me just start there, functions by the law of circulation. Are you with me? Ecclesiastes 1 describes the sun rises and it descends. The rivers flow into the sea and back again. 
We see this law in the fading of the flowers and then the budding again. In a generation that comes and in a generation that goes. We see this law of circulation in the universe in the orbiting of, of, of our planets, the sun rising, the sun descending, we see it in the four seasons and the constant turning, all that God has designed. So under the law of circulation, we see this promise. Even in this law of circulation, day and night, no matter what season you find yourself in, that all things work together for good to them that love God, for all that are the called according to his purposes. Do you see that? Now watch this. Psalm 19, verse 67. Its rising is from one end of the heaven and its circuit to the other end. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. So God sees everything. I say God sees everything. The law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul. God's word is perfect to bring your soul to the place of being fully saved. So how many of you know that for generations, some believe that the earth is flat? If you read scriptures, it was there all along and it tells you it is rising from one end of heaven and it circuits to the other end. Everything works in the law of circulation. And how many of you know that God is always completely in control? God is totally sovereign. Say yes. I'm going to explain it a little bit today. But there are times we need to understand who God is talking to. Because God is not always talking to everybody. Sometimes he's talking to specific people. Some people will come and say, how can you tell me God is good when this terrible thing has just happened to us? How can you come to me and say God is sovereign and that God is in control of every detail of my life when these things go wrong. I want you to pay close attention. I want to say this. God is always in control. Now, but as far as God being involved, listen to my words. As far as God being involved in every detail, whose life are we talking about? Follow carefully. So I begin to see things in a new light and I have never seen before. God says to Joseph, when he was 30, when I called him out of prison. My son was 30 when I called him by his name. John the Baptist was 30 when he began to preach. Ezekiel was 30 when he began to prophesy. David became king of Israel when he was 30. So what I want to say to you, our season has come. It speaks of a timing in God where there was a junction where now all of a sudden something else starts to happen and transpire in your life. And all of these men. And I want to say to you, I believe it's our season. I've been saying it for some time. If you don't believe it, it's fine. I believe it for myself, my family, my wife, my children, my grandchildren. I also believe it for the church. Come on. Here's what the Lord says. I want to explain something. I rule and prepare every intersection for all that I have created. For all will come to their own intersection of their own decisions. Each circle of life, there will be the opportunities for obedience and for disobedience. But for those who seek after me, I work in every detail in between every, in, in every intersection. I'm going to read this again. I rule and prepare every intersection for all that I've created. So here's the picture. There are intersections in your life. Come on, how many of you know that? Some of you didn't stay at primary school. I hope so. Some went to high school. Say intersection. Some went to university, an intersection. Some got married, intersection. Some had children, intersection. God calls you to go into ministry, preparation, intersection. After qualification, intersection. Practical, that you have to intersection. And then comes a time when God says, now you're ready to do what I call you to do. 
You understand? There are intersections in life. But in between those intersections, there's multiple of choices that can be exercised. That's what I'm going to try and say to you. So, there are intersections in life. Beginning, the, and there are intersections one after the other. These gaps could be five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, as we see in the life of these people. It is actually called this. It's called Kronos time and Kairos time. Do you see that? Okay. Kronos meaning the duration of time. That time in between the intersections. And then you find the Kairos times. The moment that you have to push the baby. That's the intersection. Nine months Kronos, one month Kairos. You understand what I'm saying? It is the appointed time when the heavens are pregnant with purpose. You've heard me say that before. In other words, you have fulfilled a certain purpose up to now. But now all of a sudden the heavens are pregnant again with purpose, a divine or higher purpose for your life that, that, brings that, in, in, that comes to that intersection of your life, that kairos of your life, where you have to make certain decisions to be able to fulfill the purpose of God. You understand? Otherwise, you're going to stay in Kronos time without the intersections of Kairos because you don't realize the Kairos. You don't recognize it. You don't understand it. I've had many Kairoses in my life. Many. In ministry, many Kairoses. So in my mind, I see this intersection. God says, I rule and prepare every intersection for all that I've created. Everyone gets this. For all will come to their own intersection or intersections, if you will, of decision. which With each cycle of life, there will be opportunities, as I said, for obedience and disobedience. Now, people are disobedient, and when they are disobedient, what happens? They circulate back again into the old. But for those who seek after me, I work in every detail in between the intersection, and I'm going to give you a scripture for this now, orchestrating every good outcome in the minute details of their daily living. Listen, many of you have not experienced this yet. Yeah, you can say yes. But, but God's desire is for those that are so focused on Him, so love Him, so intertwined with Him, that he wants to get involved in every detail of your life. Where you live from such a dimension, it is God. Not just on a Sunday, but from a Monday to a Sunday. Even when you drive to the, to the, to the, to the shopping mall, that God will give you the parking right in front of the door. That's not spooky. To you, some of it might be spooky. And I know we have those spooky people. They want the parking, but they don't understand the scripture. The detail can only come after you know the scripture. You understand? You can pray as much you for the, what much you want to for that parking spot. It's, it's going to cause you to go way back there. And Lizelle said to me yesterday, uh, who feel? If, if you at Epcot Center, if you park at each spot every day of your life. It will take you 31 years to park in every spot. I think that's quite some time. It's a little bit of a big parking lot. So here's my sermon. Where do you want to park? <laughs> Sounds a good title. <laughs> Where do you want to park? Hallelujah. For those who seek after me, I work in every detail in between the intersection, orchestrating every good outcome in the minute details of their life. The more they engage me, the more I'm involved in every detail of their life. This is our problem. We only involve God when we need Him. And then we want Him to bring the outcome. But He says, that's not how it works, honey. You can't just have a kiss from your wife when you feel good. No, sometimes you have to bring flowers. Sometimes you have to work up to that thing. Understand what I'm saying? Same with God. He wants to know that you're in love with Him. Good. 
He said, I will go ahead of them and prepare the way and I will ride with them while they are getting there. One more time. I will go ahead of them and prepare the way and then I will ride with them while they're getting there. James 4, the first part of verse 8 says this, Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. So, part of the word draw speaks of an attraction. Saying the more you are attracted to me, the more I'm attracted to you. So it's a love story. You all see that? It's a love story. Now, regarding all, Isaiah 40, 22 says this. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. The earth is a circle. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. But in verse 31, he gets a little bit more personal about these grasshoppers. Watch this. But those, say those, not everyone. Here he's talking to certain people who wait on the Lord. Now that word wait, it actually means you rest in Him. Now, I know Tina spoke about, and I also said, sometimes people have to get off their blessed assurance and start to do something. Just walk in the direction that God can direct your footsteps. This is not that wait. That wait is while I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, I rest in Him. You understand? It's not a mean, you're not active. You're passive. It's not passive. It's active. That resting is active. He said, who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You all see that? And then he, he adds in chapter 41, verse 10, he says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. Now he's talking to you this morning. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Again in verse 13 it says, Fear not, I will help you. Come on, say something. Thank you, Jesus. And so you notice in Isaiah 40 verse 22 is describing, he sits above the circle of the earth and all of the inhabitants are like grasshoppers. But then he comes into verse 31. He says, but those, he is talking to you, who wait on the Lord, they shall. Come on, renew this thing. They shall mount up with wings like you. They shall run, not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. To them he says, fear not, I am with you. Don't be dismayed. Yes, I will strengthen you. Yes, I will. I will. Yes, I will uphold you with the righteousness of my hand. And then he gets his fear not, I will help you. He's talking directly to you. Yeah? So that means God is sovereign over all, not necessarily involved in every detail as such. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the outcome. You've you got to understand something. In between the intersections... People make decisions and they will live according to the decisions that they make. As many times in those, in, the kairos is phenomenal because it becomes an experience with God. But then there comes this walking out. And in the walking out, many times they forget God. I say this many times, and it was my experience. I say in all of my major decisions in life, I've never missed God. Never. Why? Because it was a major decision. So I made sure that I know the will of God concerning the decisions. But there were many, many decisions in between where I missed Him. Where I made those decisions out of myself. Versus treat those decisions with the same seriousness as the major decisions. Because you say to yourself, oh, this is easy. I know. No, no, no. Rather wait on the Lord. Okay? So... Now, that means that if people make good decisions or bad decisions, their outcomes, are, their outcomes are based on the things that they've concluded by their own thinking. It's based on what you thought. And what people will set the course of their life. And according to, as a man thinketh in his heart, or thinks in his heart, so is he. That's what the Bible says in Proverbs 23, 7. But God comes along and he's talking to you and he says, but they that wait on me, those 
that would look to me, those that engage me in the details of their thinking, I am going to be involved in the details of their life. So between the intersection, they make the bad decision. Even them, these guys whose hearts are focused on God, they're in love with God, they are serious with God, and even when in that position, they might make a wrong decision. Remember that God works with hearts. He says, so in between, if they make a bad decision, I'm going to work all things together unto their good because I will not let them lose their purpose. It's all got to do with the condition of your heart. Say something. And so when he speaks of all, he says, I sit on the circle of the earth and all the inhabitants are like grasshoppers. But they that wait on me, I'm going to renew their strength. They're going to mount up with wings of eagles. And they're going to run and not be weary. They're going to walk and not faint. And I will. He keeps on saying that. And the King James says, yeah, I will. I will. The yeah is actually meaning an assurance. He's assuring you. Yeah, I will uphold you. I, I will. Fear not. I will help you. Listen carefully. Now, when God says, I will help you, it does not mean that he was just going to help us in some major and serious matters in our lives. This is what I want you to understand. And I know some of you are facing some challenges in life right now. But it doesn't say I will help you when there's a major catastrophe, a major problem, health issue or financial challenges that you are facing. Now I'm going to come and help you. What God is saying is, and here's what it means. Yes, I will help you. He means in the most minute detail, like getting the parking spot, as I said, just in the right time. Or getting you in your car just before it starts to rain. I will hold the rain until you get in your car. I would, I would literally hold her and cause everything in the world, your world, to stand still until he fills in the details of his involvement in your life. Come on. He will be involved in every minute detail of your daily living. As insignificant as it might seem, God will be involved in every little detail. Now follow this. The next verse in Isaiah 45 verse 2 in the NIV says this. I will go before you. Listen to this. This is phenomenal. And will level the mountains. It means before you get there. I will go before you and I will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. So imagine he levels the mountain before you get there. That means that major obstacle that has presented itself in your life that wants to prohibit you from fulfilling that which God has called you. God said, I will deal with it even before you get there. You would not even know that it existed, that it was there. Mountains speak of monumental problems, challenges. Before you get to that major obstacle, God has leveled it before you arrived and all you see is a plane. It's flat. Then he says, he cuts to the bars of iron. It means this. That means that that which would have been there that would have imprisoned you. But he says, I will cut through the bars. So before you get there, God breaks down the bars of iron. So that you cannot be imprisoned by whatever situation you might find yourself in. Come on, this is good. Psalm 38 says this, verse 7. Though I walk in the midst of trouble. Look at this. Look at this. This is all things working for good. You will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies. And your right hand will save me. The, the Lord will protect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. How long? Forever. Let's go to Psalm 139, and I want you to listen carefully and understand and how specific God is about this particular people that he's talking about. That's the next psalm. It says this, O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. 
You understand my thought afar off. That's God's involvement in your life in the detail. You comprehend my path and my laying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, on my tongue. But, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me. God will hedge you. You have hedged me behind and before. And lay, it means God protects you. That's what it means. And lay your hand upon me. How many of you want God's hand upon you? Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. To understand this, God, this is just too much. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Now watch this. God here is saying, you can't escape me no matter where you're going. That's what he's saying. Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, in whatever circumstance you might find yourself, it feels and it seems like hell. He says, behold, you are there. Like Joseph, he didn't take away the prison, but he was with him in the prison. You understand? He might still be in that circumstance, but take your eyes of the circumstances and put your eyes on the one that's there with you in that circumstances. He did not leave you alone. I am with you, he said. I am with you. People need to start to understand this. I am with you. I am with you. I am with you no matter where you find yourself. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me. Watch this now. Even I say, here comes the darkness. Even the night shall be light about me. That darkness shall be light about you. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. Like what? Light. Isn't that phenomenal? Pay attention to verse 13. For you form my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. It's time that you stop listening to other people, what they think about you. You are fearfully and wonderful. God is saying this about you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous. You are a marvelous work of God. I say you are a marvelous work of God. God is involved in every detail of your rising and your sitting. You can't escape his detailed involvement. Verse 3 again. Thou compass, Psalm 139 verse 3 says, Thou compassest my path and my laying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Now the word compass, it's actually the word compass which is used to determine geographical direction. That's what the word means. It means the magnetic needle freely pivots until it aligns with the predetermined direction that God has planned for your life. That's what it actually means. God encompassed. Are you ready for this? So the purpose of God is the compass. And the needle is his will. You all see that? So the compass is the purpose. The purpose of God is the compass and the needle is his will. The compass may spin in a circle to align us according to his will eventually. The more we are engaged with God, the less God's spinning is in our compass. Can you, let me read that one more time. You all got the compass and the needle? So the compass may spin in a circle to align us eventually with the needle of his will. The more we are engaged with God, the less spinning in our compass. Now let me tell you something about flying. Now I, I used to fly. Um, I was a pilot. I used to fly many years ago. And eventually my life became too busy and uh, just couldn't keep it up anymore. 
but we went hunting last week, and uh, we, we, we chartered a King Air. And if you know a King Air, it's a big aircraft, seat eight people, twin, double twins, heavy aircraft. Now, I only flew singles, open rating on singles, and variable pitch, retractable under gear, super coolers, turbocharged, all those things. You don't get it today anymore. You've got to be rated on every, every aircraft. So here comes this guy to come and pick us up there at the farm. We went hunting at Chris Barnard's farm. And I came back this Saturday to be Sunday in church. Just an example. So, <coughs> yes. I mentioned that so somebody must hear it. You don't even know that I could have sat on the farm that Sunday. But anyhow, uh, here comes this guy to come and pick us up. Yeah, here he comes. On the dirt strip, he lands that thing and he stops. And he gets out, the bald-headed guy. The most jovial guy I've ever met in my life. He calls me Boss Ben. Hello, Boss Ben. White guy, he calls me Boss Ben. Uh, what's your name? My name is Kalahari. What do you mean Kalahari? So I'll tell you later. So we're in the plane, load up every, all the stuff, and in the plane, at the, as we say, I heard you're flying. I said, no, no, I used to fly. I don't fly anymore. How many hours? So about 800 hours. And uh, he just keeps quiet. He, and he became a training captain on 737s for, for Com Air, Sam Air, and all, uh, Com Air and um, um, Kalula. He used to fly for them for 23 years as a captain. But this guy, he was a policeman. See our purpose, the, the intersections? He was a policeman that became part of the uh, special uh, um, uh, forces. And then eventually another intersection, and he decided he wanted to go fly. Another intersection. And now he's just in training. This moment he's training 11 guys from India. They bought out the, the, the simulators. If you go to John Smith's or Tambo, you see them on the right-hand side. There are three of them. They bought that now. And they're training people. That's all he does. And he does charters. So I heard you're flying. So now I, I used to. And as we, he took off that plane. He says, okay, the, the stock is yours. The sticks are yours. He said, I grabbed the stuff. Had to trim the thing out. There we go. Up to 20,000 feet. Uh, put on the uh, ATC, put on the uh, autopilot, and then we flew till we passed Lanseria, and then he started to des de descend with the autopilot, and when we got over 8,000 feet, he said, okay, now it's yours, you land this thing. So I came through the mountain here, and I did my left hand downwind, base, finals, and I land that thing. These guys, Yanni and them, they all <laughs> took a video of it. Couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it either. <laughs> But I said just that as a, as, a, as a free form. But I want to say something about compass. When you fly, and you, because what he did, he immediately, uh, he immediately um, uh, set my, my compass for me. Because he had digitals in front of me. My compass, I can see it, and I knew what direction I had to fly. And then what speed, it's easy to adjust that. And I, and I did it. So a compass works like this. If you fly in a certain direction, now flying, if, you, if you're on your way, purpose in a certain direction. And the moment you veer off course, this is the check. I remember till today. The most diff by, the way, by the way, little lesson in flying. The most difficult thing in flying, you know what it is? Straight and level. To fly straight and level. It's the most difficult thing of flying. Because the plane does this all the time. So here's the check. Change, check, hold, adjust, trim. So, now I'm flying my purpose, and I'm off purpose, so I change it. I check my compass, is it right? I hold it, I adjust it if I need to, then I trim my plane, so it stays steady in that course. So that's many times what God is requiring of us. We are all over the place. God says, change, hold it, check, adjust if you have to, and then trim it. You trim it according to the word of God. The word will hold you steady on course. That's what it's got and compass around us. He's given us this compass, but some of you compass are spinning the whole time because you're in and out, in and out of the word, in and out of the word. And God says, there's no way you're going to get to your destination that way. The needle is going to stay the same way where it has to hit. If it's just that thing, that's the course. If you fly this way, that way, you're going to miss it. So let that compass spin until it doesn't spin no more. And it is heading in the right direction that God has called it for. Do you hear what I'm saying? So that's actually what that scripture means. So change, check, hold, adjust, trim. You got it. 
Okay. So Psalm 56 verse 8 in the Amplified. You have taken account of my wanderings. That's a plane doing this. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not recorded in your book? God remembers everything. Then I, I love Job 14 verse 16. Surely then you will count my steps, but not keep track of my sin. You see, here we come. This is, this is why we many times miss what God has for us, for, for, in store for us. You know, one of the things that kind of bother me a little bit, and this is what we've been taught in the season, the translators and translations, many of them are so sin conscious that when the word compass is used, when well, in some translation, it says, you scrutinize my path versus you encompass me. It's like this. With a sin conscious mind. You are watching. Like they are always looking for sin. Because you are sin conscious. So they that translate with a sin consciousness. But as far as how the word of God reads in Job 14 verse 16. You will count my steps. But not keep track of my sin. Psalm 119 verse 168 puts it all together. So I keep your precepts and your testimonies for all my ways are before you. Do you see that? How many? All my ways. Listen to Isaiah 65 verse 24. It says, it shall come to pass. It shall come to pass that before they call, <coughs> that's the dimension you are living in, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. Somebody needs to say hallelujah. Then in Galatians 5, Paul takes this principle to a whole new level and he calls it walking in the Spirit. He elevates this understanding in saying in verse 16, I say then, walk in the Spirit, watch this now, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now I want you to see this. Okay, let's... Now you... You see how it's always seemingly referring to the failure of sin in the flesh. Seemingly. But here's what it's actually is saying. And I'm going to give it to you in other words, which are actually the right words. He says, walk in the inward walk of the Spirit. And you shall not be affected or carry out or give into the demands of your natural life. That's what it means. That you will not give in to the demands of your natural life. You see that in verse 18. But if you are, are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. If you're led by the Spirit, you're what? Not under the law. What is it saying? It means that you are not under the rule of self. That's the law. That you're not under the rule of self, but under the control of the Holy Spirit. Being under law or grace is simply this. One is about what self can do, and the other is about what the Holy Spirit can do. Are you with me? That's why I say many times our decisions is that which we do in self, because it's easy, versus grace. Okay? So, so being under the law or grace is simply this. One is about self, what self can do, and the other is about what the Holy Spirit can do. Two different dependencies. Do you hear what I'm saying? Now, Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, not the Beatrice Salad of last night, the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Do you know how many people I've had sitting in front of me counseling, well, I feel led by the Spirit. You know... The hard source thing for me is this. I wish I can be really frank, like I am many times. You know what I would like to say? You liar. Because you are, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are attributing something to the Holy Spirit that he would never have done. So be very careful. Very careful when you said. I'm led by the Spirit. Or oh, I felt. Make sure what you felt. Was it the barbecue of last night? 
maybe a little bit heavy on your stomach. What did you feel? It's very important because the Bible says, for many are led, for as many that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Can you see this? No. When the Word of God speaks of being led by the Spirit, I don't really get into many, much detail. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Listen, the law is dependent on self-effort. The law is dependent on self-effort. While grace operates by a higher power of the influence of the Holy Spirit. And the grace, the Holy Spirit rules and intervenes on your behalf. And controls every minute detail of your life. Do you understand? When Paul comes along and he says, I say walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the demands. You will not be under the control, the effect, the influences of the demands of this natural world or this natural life. That's what he was saying. When it says the flesh, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, sin or temptation. In some cases, it might refer to that. But what he's actually speaking of is that we will not be under the control of what we naturally need. Did you get that? Very important. Under the control of your need. We are, we are controlled by a higher order. You see, many times it's that need that now puts pressure on you to make decisions that's not lined with the Word of God. You hear what I'm saying? Instead of waiting for God to work that thing out for you. We are controlled by a higher order. So when he says, walk in the Spirit, some people think you ought to walk and speak in tongues uh, um, as you are waiting for the, for the bus to come. And listen, I'm not opposed to people speaking in the Spirit or communicating with God. I need you to understand what it's saying. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. What that means is that their identity in God is the place from which they function. Oh, did you get that? Their identity in God is the place from which they function. Who they are in spirit, who they are as the sons of God, is the position or becomes the position, but is the position of their thinking. Being led by the Spirit is not describing walking in the middle of the highway speaking in tongues. Wonderful if you do it. Just be careful for the bus, taxi. But that's not what it's saying. What it's describing is that we have become connected, acquainted, joined to a much higher dimension of living. There's a major difference in the lives of those who walk in the Spirit and those who walk after the flesh or self-effort. Walking in the flesh means you are walking under the obligation of all the physical, natural world and the obligations of our physical, natural life. Walking in the Spirit means our dependencies on much higher order than the natural. You can actually get to the place where you live in the Spirit. You can. And that's where I believe that God wants to take us now in the next season of our life. Paul says, since if you live in the Spirit... That's where your life belongs. Walk in it. Now, since you live there, now walk in it. That's what he's saying. What he says is, is you could actually reach the place, and this is what I pray for all of us, and we could actually reach that place where you are more confident in the overruling, intervening of the power of God than the logical cycles of this natural world. Come on, are you with me? What Paul is saying is there are two major differences in the lives of those who are walking in the Spirit and those who are walking after, after the flesh or self-effort. Paul says to those in Christ, he's talking to those that are not part of those people who are walking in the Spirit. He's, he's talking to them instead. This is not for everyone, the Bible says. Philippians 2.13 For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Paul is describing to them the call. If God, it's, it's God who works in you both to want to do according to his good pleasure. Then Ephesians 5, 18, the B part says, be filled with the Spirit. You can't walk in the Spirit if you're not filled. 
Say, be filled. It's not a one time expecting the Holy Ghost. Yes, you begin there. But notice, be filled. It's present tense, constant and continually. It's a continually be filled. It's not a request, it's an order or a demand. Do you hear me? Be filled is an ongoing experience. A spirit filled life is one that manifests the life and character of Christ. Galatians 5, 22, 23 describes the fruit of the Spirit, which eventually must become visible when you live in that dimension. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit, verse 25. It doesn't mean walk in dreamland, la-la land. It's saying like, like this, living in the Spirit identifies where you live. Living in the Spirit identifies, in actual fact, your life. It should read, since you live in the Spirit, that's where you live, that's where you are. Do you hear what I'm saying? That is where your life belongs. Therefore, walk there, practice, implement, live there, walk it out in your true identity, which is in Christ. Living in the Spirit is who you are in Christ. Walking in the Spirit is implementing, implementing, manifesting who you are in Christ. That's what it means. It's not something that you try to do. It's who you are. It's an identity. Come on, help me. That means everything you think, everything that you do, you're coming from the absolute inward persuasion that you're a son of God or you're a daughter of God. Do you listen to what I'm saying? 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Come on. Don't you know who you are? Paul is saying the same thing. Since you live in the Spirit, that's where your identity is. That's where your life belongs. That's where your true nature is, your true identity is. Now walk in that place. See, when you walk in that place as a son of God, male or female, then God is involved in every minute detail of your life. Even though you might find yourself in prison like Joseph. Or in hell like David. Do you hear what I'm saying? Your hairs are counted. Your steps are ordered. Listen, God knows all things. It doesn't mean he's involved in them, but he knows all, all things. You understand? He knows everything, every thought, every person that has ever existed, all at the same time, all knowing, all seeing, omnipresent, absolutely can't take that away from him. But he's involved. No. Not in every detail. You make decisions, but it depends on where you live. God is in heaven, man is in earth. Man has all the dominion. What is man that you are mindful of him, the Bible says. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and you gave him all things. A man has dominion over all the works of your hands. So man is completely in control of everything that takes place on the world. But it depends from what position you live. So, all the hunger, the wars, the darkness, the wickedness, the evil, the murder, the corruption, the wars, the annihilation of humanity, all of the evils of history, it's all man's fault. That's who did it, not God. Are you with me? That's who thought it out. That's who planned it. Shows you where they live from. And that's who executed it. So now God has to find some people through whom he could work. God will come to someone like Ezekiel and say, Son of man, prophesy. You all hear Ezekiel says, God is looking for a man to stand in the gap on behalf of the earth. Remember? And he found none. God is still looking for somebody that can stand in the gap. God hears the heavens. The heavens hear the earth. Uh, do you remember that? I'm making a point here. Paul is describing those that live in the heavens. I believe God can change anything because I said so. If I live from the heavens. I believe God can change this nation because you said so. If you live from the heavens. I believe God can change the whole government because you said so. 
Come on, somebody need to believe this. I believe God can remove kings and establish kings because you said so. Since you live in the Spirit, that is your identity. Walk in the Spirit means you know your position and you know your authority. You speak from whom you are in Christ. You don't come as a sinner. You don't come as a slave. You don't come as somebody that's needy. You come as the authority of God in the earth. So Paul comes and he says, don't you know who you are? Do you not know? 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. It means self-rejected. That's what it says. He asks, do you not know who you are? Don't you know you, your own self? You are how Christ is in you. Except you be a reprobate. That's what he says. Meaning except you, you are self-rejected. Listen, it's not the devil. It's not God. Many times people themselves reject themselves. Because you don't believe the finished work of the cross. You've rejected yourself. You believe you're disqualified. Your circumstances and the things that went wrong in your life speaks louder to you than the word of God who tells you who you are. You believe you're not worthy. You believe it's about you. That's the problem. You believe your sin is greater than his blood. If that's what you believe, you're self-rejected. You rejected it. But as far as God is concerned, he paid the price. He shed the blood. It is finished. I don't care what you've done. He's done it already. Now, the problem is people can't get over themselves. That's the problem. You can't get over yourselves. So the sin, the failure, the weakness, the weakness and evils is in their way because they live from the past. Now, listen, so Paul comes and he says, since you already live in the Spirit, it's now who you are. Now you may keep slipping back because you don't really believe it, People pray, Lord, please help me. Help me in the flesh. He can't. God does not improve your flesh. Oh, you got to hear this. I say, God didn't come to fix Adam. He came to replace him. God does not improve your flesh. Listen, you cannot ask God to come and make you holy. Here we go. You can't ask God to make you better. You can ask God to make you stop sinning. It doesn't work that way. That's the law. Here's grace. Grace says, I can't help. I can't help you get holy. But when you identify yourself with him who is holy, then you are holy. You see? I've taken out from you the old nature and put into you the new nature. I've taken out of you the old identity and put into you the new identity. The new identity is already holy, already righteous, and already perfect. You have to believe it. That's all you have to do. There's no power in the heaven that is able to improve the lifestyle of the flesh. If God was to improve your flesh, Jesus is completely unnecessary. You hear what I'm saying? Then we go back to the law and make sacrifice and pay penance and, and come and you pay the price. That's how it's done. It's just so good. It's so easy. It's hard to accept, but the fact is this. It's done. It's the finished work of the cross. Therefore, it's something we implement because we believe. We believe. Your, your failures must not dictate your belief. You believe because it's the truth. Amen? And so as much as I know, you know, but sometimes it's good to be reminded. I believe Jesus himself prepared this word for us today. I believe Jesus himself is right here preaching to you right now. He keeps coming in form after form after form. He says, let them be one. I believe I'm one with him. I believe you are one with him. I believe we are one with him. We are one. We're not 10. We are one. Say so yes. Since you live in the spirit then, walk there. Live there, practice there, implement, constant, be filled, be baptized. 
It's a walking, living in the realm of the Spirit and bearing its fruit. The way King David describes it is you are being controlled. Controlled. He used the word controlled. You are under the control, the influence of the Spirit. He says in Psalm 139 verse 30, For thou hast possessed my reins. He possessed our in, in, inside. He possessed our inner parts. He possessed us. He evolved in every detail. I believe the Lord is saying, your season has arrived because you live from this dimension. Listen, I believe your season has arrived. I will take care, God is saying, I will take care of every situation in your life if you believe this, that you walk according to the nature of the Spirit of God in the earth, no matter where you find yourself. I will, I will solve matters before they arrive. I will go ahead of you and prepare your ways. I will do more in this season than all of the previous seasons combined, God is saying. I'm going to say this one more time because you need to believe this. Your season has arrived. Hallelujah. When I will take every situation of your life, I will take care of every situation, God is saying, of your life. I will solve matters before they arrive. I will go ahead of you and prepare your way. I will do more in this season than all of the previous seasons combined. Come on, say yes. We were sinners saved by grace. But since we've been transformed, born again, we are now new. Not fixed, not repaired. But we are new. Say new. new. You are new. You are brand new. That's who you are. It's that other guy that did all that stuff. Not you. You are new. Come on. You are new. All things are passed away. Behold all things. All things have become new. Peter, Peter told Jesus, we forsook everything. We forsook our family. forsook our homes. What's in it for us? What about us? Jesus said, you'll get a hundredfold blessing when? In this life. Listen, even if it's going to cost you a lot of stuff, you have to walk away from it. God is a God of compensation. I say, God is a God of compensation. But then he said, you will sit with me. That's the next level God is talking. Is you will sit with me and you will rule the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, I want to throw something in here. I wonder if I should. Just for you to provoke your thinking. When Jesus said that, you were speaking to whom? You were speaking to the 12 disciples. Guess who was still part of that being disciple tri tribe? You will rule the 12 tribes of Israel. What that means is, you will sit on 12 thrones and you will dictate what would happen in the body of Christ on the earth. You will decree it and that, that's what's going to happen. What happens in the body is what happens in the world. I want you to say and declare. I'm saying this and I declare this. God shut it down. Just shut everything down. Shut the man down. Shut his mouth. Sit him down. Remove him. Do what you're going to do in the name of Jesus. Let the name of Jesus rise up again over every believer. God, you said to Abram, if you're, if you're about 10, I'll save the city. But I believe that we are more than 10. So God can do something. You know, God said to Abram, he said, choose the land. He said, choose the land when God sent him. So he turned to Lot and he said to him, listen, whatever way you choose, I'll go the other way. And, the, and, the, and, and they split the land and they separated. And Lot chose the better spot, the better part of the land, a nice area. But you know what? Drought followed Lot. Drought. But rain followed Abraham. No matter where you go. Whatsoever you choose, if it's in the will and the purpose of God, in the natural, it might not look like the right decision. God will be there. I believe this is Goshen. 
What happens here is sunshine and rain. Blessing come to Goshen. And so I'm believing that there's going to be a major transformation in your life, in my life, but I believe in this nation and in the government of this nation and the nations. Come on, somebody believe me. I particularly, the most importantly, I believe the church of Jesus Christ. There's coming a transformation to the church of Jesus Christ at large. You have to know how powerful your words are. What you will say will carry much more weight. We have been called kings and priests unto our God. He's, in going, he's, going to, uh, he's going to go to the kings of the earth. That's where God is going to go. To the kings of, of, of the earth. Who he has established us as kings. Who are walking according to his divine purpose. And God's going to give those kings authority again. To rule in the earth like we've never seen before. Also in the spiritual we're going to see priests taps into a dimension of the Spirit of God like we've never seen before because they are living in that dimension. And from that dimension, they operate and they move and they have their being, as God says. He's going to go to the kings. We are the kings and the priests of this earth. Say yes. So rule and reign as He has commanded you. I believe this is your season. We have to get done with the things of the flesh. Start to operate from the dimension of the Spirit. And once we make our decision and we rely and we wait on Him and we make our decisions from that time, even the in between, the intersection, God will be involved in every detail of your life. Although for a moment you might find yourself in the prison of your circumstances, that will not dictate your future. That will not dictate the outcome. That will not dictate what God has spoken over your life. Because God says, I'm leading my sons by my spirit. And where I am taking them, I'm leveling the mountains. I'm breaking iron gates. Whatever comes against you will not be able to hold or stand. Because you are led by me. And I am involved in every detail of your life. Therefore, everything will work out for good for those that love God. Come on, somebody, can you believe that? It's time to live from another dimension. Get away from the flesh. The natural dictates. And let the Spirit start to dictate to you. And when you make decisions, don't be in a hurry. Wait on the Lord and make the decision according to the demands of heaven. Now, our biggest problem is our mind. Our biggest problem is our mind. I want to just read you something that I got of uh, um, Francois from the mirror. That was just blessed me. It says, it's an important verse. Uh, so often the translation goes wrong or misunderstood. Of 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. Paul says in the Greek, where he says, um, we have to take every thought captive. Remember that story? Because our biggest problem for us to prohibiting us from living from the dimension of the spirit is our mind. The way we think. Amen. We are drawn back into the natural. Watch this now. This is going to help some of you. He says, they, he said, that we arrest, that's what that scripture actually means. We, that we arrest every thought at spear point. This is important to notice. notice. It is the power, watch this. It's the power in the sharpness of the spear that arrests, or the sword that arrests the thought. What is God's word? It's a thought. The power is in the sharpness, the ability, the sharpness of that sword. Okay? In the previous verse, Paul says, we have weapons that demolish strongholds. A stronghold is typically a mindset or a thought pattern. Now, if a single thought, watch this now, many of your lives. If a single um, thought can activate and engage a complete thought pattern, pattern almost like opening a complete document on your computer with a single click just one thought open up a whole field a whole felt a whole file then if that thought can be arrested the thought pattern is also deactivated so that's why we have to be quick not give time to meditate when a thought comes into your mind which is inaccurate you have to believe that this word, the sharpness of this sword, has the power to eradicate that thing. Amen? Here is the good news. Paul did not say, like unfortunately most translations do, we must make thoughts obedient to Christ. That's not what it says. The Greek says, we arrest 
cast every thought at spear point. Why? How? By the obedience of Christ to whom? To God. Because of Christ's obedience to God, you can arrest that thought. Do you see that? Not because you bring that thought in obedience to Christ. No, because of Christ's obedience, because of the finished work, the sword is powerful. It can cut that one thought that will eradicate that whole mindset. That's what God is after. The Greek says, we arrest every thought at spear point by the obedience of Christ. Come on, it's time. Don't let that thing come and enter your life and defile you and upset you. When it comes, take the word because it's sharp. It's powerful. Kill that thought and live from the dimension of the spirit. That is what God requires of us. Come on, God is involved in every detail. I say God is involved in every detail. Stand to your feet. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you. As of this day, we do not live according to the flesh, but we live according to the spirit of God. The Spirit of God, because we are led by the Spirit of God, because we are sons of God. And we thank you for that. Thank you that this word will be powerful, transforming and changing the lives of our people. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I love you.